Good morning. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, July 7th. We are joined today by the Minister of Health and Social Services, the Honourable Tracy Ann McPhee, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Our sign language interpretation is provided by Mary Thiessen and our French language translation by André Boursier. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name and you will each have two questions. Minister McPhee. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pat. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We are speaking to you this morning from the uh, territory, a traditional territory of the Kuala Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachan Council. Last week was our 100th COVID-19 update. As we pass this milestone, our journey continues. And as we have said many, many times before, we are all in this together. I want to start by thanking all the volunteers who've been out in the Southern Lakes region packing sandbags and offering support as water levels continue to rise and we work to stave off major flooding. Times are very uncertain and tough right now for many Yukoners and seeing strangers come together to help truly makes all the difference. We should all be very, very proud of our community. Please keep up the great work and I encourage everyone who can lend a hand to do so. Much of what Dr. Hanley and I have to say today, we said last week, but as we continue to see the virus spread, it bears repeating. We are still in the middle of the first true wave of COVID-19 in the Yukon and our behaviors need to change. This remains a serious situation. We know there is a great deal of disruption and uncertainty right now in our territory. We are worried about floods and fires, but we need to concentrate on how we can all adjust our behaviors and keep each other safe. We continue to see community spread of this virus and over the past month, COVID-19 has continued to strongly affect our vulnerable population. Our teams are working closely with social services to ensure that necessary supports are made available. We understand that self-isolation for some individuals can be extremely difficult, and we are working to provide appropriate placements, supervision, and supports. Once individuals are identified, support, support is provided to help with the transition into self-isolation and other wraparound services that they may need. The spread of COVID-19 through our more vulnerable community is only one of our issues. The spread of COVID-19 has not stopped in our wider community. Yukoners with COVID-19 symptoms have been continuing to be out in our communities and to show up in workplaces. This has to stop. While a runny nose or mild sore throat may seem like minor symptoms, we cannot forget that they are also symptoms of COVID-19. In our current reality, a cough or a runny nose or muscle aches or a sore throat must all be considered serious. Stay home, stay away from other people and go to get tested so that you have some closure and some certainty. Even if you're fully vaccinated, you should get tested if you have symptoms. Testing turnaround times remain very quick and negative results can be accessed online often within 24 hours of the test. Anyone experiencing symptoms in Whitehorse should call the COVID-19 Testing and Assessment Centre at 867-393-3083 to book an appointment or you can book online at yukon.ca. Drive up testing is also available in Whitehorse without an appointment at the centre from 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. daily. An appointment is of course encouraged, but if you cannot make one, a drive up, the drive up centre is available at 49A Waterfront Place, just near uh, where Motor Vehicles uh, is located in Whitehorse. Most people know where that is. People in communities should contact their rural community health centre to arrange for testing. 
Please take the time that you need to look after yourselves. Take the rest that you need and to keep those around you safe. Staying home when you're not feeling well is how we protect others, including children under 12 who cannot at this time get the vaccine. That being said, I know that choosing not to go to work can be a stressful decision for many people. There are always bills to be paid and a fridge to fill. Your government is here to support you. I want to remind everyone about the paid sick leave rebate program. This program is available to Yukon businesses and to self-employed people. The program supports Yukon workers that do not have paid sick leave. If they need to stay home because they've become sick, if they are caring for another household member who is sick, or if they're required to self-isolate due to the COVID-19 provisions. The program was launched in March of 2020 and has been renewed for 2021. If you, need the pro if you used the program last year, you can still access it again this year. Please spread the word about this program. Tell your friends and family and your colleagues. Encourage private employers to apply for this benefit. It is available to help. There are also other programs available to support Yukoners during this pandemic. The Yukon Business Relief Program is available to help with specific business costs. This program was also renewed at the end, uh, to, until the end of September of 2021. Eligible Yukon businesses may receive up to $30,000 per month and up to $60,000 in total to help cover fixed business costs. There are also other relief programs for the tourism industry. You can learn more information about all of these supports at yukon.ca. We have committed to continue these supports for as long as they are needed to support Yukoners. So many Yukoners have helped, uh, helped and stepped up really in phenomenal ways to help combat this health crisis. There are hundreds of public servants who have mobilized and changed their roles at work to support the COVID-19 response. In fact, across the territory, community members from all professions with all kinds of valued skill sets have provided additional support. Many volunteers have seen, uh, have stepped up to this challenge as well. Last week, I mentioned resources from other jurisdictions that were on their way. I'm very pleased to say that we have had 11 additional healthcare staff on the ground supporting our teams, thanks to the Canadian Red Cross and thanks to uh, several public health districts in Ontario and people uh, who have self-identified for their skills to come and support us. There's one additional individual also set to arrive uh, today uh, or tomorrow from Ontario as well. These considered and passionate professionals will be supporting immunization, testing, case management, contact tracing, and wellness support. We are truly grateful for this support. I know everyone here in the Yukon who is responding to this pandemic in one way or another has put in relentless energy and many, many long hours. We're all very aware of the fatigue, the burnout, the mental wellness and mental health impacts that this pandemic is having on you all. Yukoners appreciate your sacrifices, your professionalism and your resilience. This additional support will provide some very well-deserved respite. Thank you to everyone who helped make this happen. We know our current wave is still spreading quickly among our unvaccinated population. The vaccines provide the best level of protection that is currently available against COVID-19. We have enough vaccines for everyone that wants one here in the territory. This includes our youth between 12 and 17 years of age. We are fortunate Many other countries across the world do not yet have the kind of vaccine access that they need. Our vaccinated, uh, sorry, our dedicated vaccine teams 
are back in communities this week. You may have heard that on local media. They're visiting Mayo, Pelly Crossing, Carmax, Dawson City, and Old Crow. You can get your first or your second shot at these clinics. The clinic in Whitehorse is open to everyone age 12 and up. You can book an appointment and find out more information on yukon.ca. This is our shot. Thank you to every single person who has helped with our vaccine rollout. You have made history and you have saved lives. I hope you know how much Yukoners appreciate your dedication and care. More than 84% of eligible adults have received their first shot and over 76% have now received a second shot. For our youth population, 68% have received their first shot and 35% have received their second one. This is progress that we can all be proud of and we must keep going. Yukoners, like all Canadians, are feeling frustrated and tired. COVID fatigue is a real thing. It is particularly upsetting for us here in the territory because we were so close to lifting our final restrictions. Our actions, the actions of each and every one of us can reflect, uh, can affect, sorry, the spread of the virus. And doing your part does not have to be complicated. There are simple steps to take. Get vaccinated. Stay home if you have symptoms and get tested. Wear your mask. Practice social distancing. Only gather in small groups of six people at a time. When we keep our groups to only six at any given time, tracing contract contracts, sorry, if necessary, is more manageable. When we follow these simple recommendations, we will see changes for the better. We must all do our part. Lastly, I hope you are enjoying the summer weather safely within your small groups. We live in one of the most beautiful places in the world. Enjoy and be kind to one another. Thank you, Shani Thun, Gunashish, Masicho, and Merci. Thank you, Minister McPhee. Dr. Hanley? Thank you. Thank you, Minister McPhee, as well. Uh, good morning, bonjour. Uh, before I begin, my uh, my further notes, I want to echo Minister McPhee's sentiments on the recent nurses and support staff who traveled long and far to assist uh, Co Yukon's COVID-19 response. And I know that uh, those who have arrived have been welcomed with open arms and smiles and tears of relief. And believe me, we're thrilled to have you here. We are starting to see a consistent number of cases being reported on a daily basis. The numbers are still concerning and we are seeing a climb in our daily active case count. So we do have a stretch to go yet. At the same time, we're now seeing the serious impact that this wave is having on people getting sick and seriously straining our hospitals and acute care system. We are well into this wave, but we have weeks ahead of us yet. In just over five weeks, we've seen 350 people infected from the age of one year to 90. I expect that we'll continue to see daily cases for at least a few more weeks, and weeks may stretch into months, given the spread that we are seeing in an unvaccinated population. And for those of you who think this should have ended a while ago, well, I'm with you. But if we continue to hold tight, stick to six, and follow the safe six, we will work through this together and gradually contain this wave. Vaccination and following the public health measures are our way out of this. Our actions over these next few weeks will determine how our case count will look. If we relax too soon, the numbers will likely stay in double digits. But if we hunker down for another week or two weeks, we should start to see a significant decrease in cases. It's really up to all of us to see a change. 
Now, there are some trends we can begin to describe, and as we accumulate more days and weeks of activity, our ability to determine trends will improve. For example, we are seeing many secondary contacts right now, and we're seeing transmission within the Whitehorse urban network of housing unstable citizens. Although we have had cases in 12 out of 14 communities, we are so far not seeing widespread transmission within any one rural community. Rather, we're seeing pockets here and there, primarily originally seeded from initial contact dating back to the Whitehorse gathering events that spurred this wave in the first place. We're also seeing the effects of showing up in workplaces while sick, and it is timely that the minister is reiterating those messages and reminding everyone about the compensations available for people to stay home when sick. This is critical for both our short-term and our long-term adaption to living with COVID, and I will come back to this later. Before I start reviewing our current case, case status, for those who are paying very close attention to the numbers, and I know there are some, I understand you may have seen discrepancies in our reporting over these past couple of weeks, due in part for, to how we account for out-of-territory cases and probable cases. Now, a probable case is one that's defined as positive based on symptoms and assessment of an individual but there are many reasons where, where individuals may not get tested. So even if not tested, these individuals, when confirmed through their, through their links and through their story, are still included in our case counts and our analysis. <clears throat> and active, active case counts includes those individuals who are diagnosed in the territory, regardless of where they live. So out-of-territory residents diagnosed in Yukon can cause that other point of confusion. And we do include them in our active case count because they're present in the territory when ill and therefore contributing to risk of COVID in territory. But they are actually counted as a case in their home jurisdiction where they live for the purposes of, of tracking and national reporting. And that's what, uh, why sometimes there are these discrepancies. For the time being, our reporting of zero to a few cases per week seems a distant memory, and our reporting from multiple sources now of testing has become a much more complicated endeavor. And while reconciling all these case counts and while determining who has recovered, who's in hospital, to what, to what time do we stop counting every day, we have established more consistent processes for reporting the data. And this is a work in progress, and I believe there will be more clarity as we go on. What's really important to remember as we get into high case numbers, though, is not so much how many, but what is my risk, and how, in general, are people doing? Who is getting sick? Who is not, and why? How is vaccine helping us? How are we helping to prevent people from getting sick? And how are we taking care of people when they are sick? Now for our status of cases. As of yesterday, there were 146 active cases of COVID-19 in the territory. 238 people have recovered since this wave began. Three Yukoners have died since early June. And we have then five deaths overall since the onset of this pandemic. As of yesterday, uh, in terms of numbers of people in, in hospital, seven people have been medevaced out of territory for further care. Six of these are still uh, presently, as of yesterday, in hospital care down south. And additional 12 people uh, were on the hospital census yesterday. You have heard me talk quite a bit about the difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated people in cases, but also in outcomes. Of our seven people medevaced out, six were unvaccinated. Of our three deaths, none was vaccinated. Of 33 people hospitalized, just three were fully vaccinated. Do vaccinated people get COVID? Yes. They do when exposed to a lot of virus, but much less often than people who are not vaccinated. 
In our situation, 87% of our cases are those who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. 11% of our cases, about 1 in 10, are fully vaccinated. If we look just at adults, 16% of adult cases are fully vaccinated. And there is a trend to older people who are fully vaccinated being more susceptible to infection while vaccinated and to more serious outcomes such as hospitalization. We believe, based on global experience to date, that these cases in people who are fully vaccinated are in circumstances where transmission is more intense. There is still much to be learned from looking in more depth from our own data and experience. What we can conclude is that if you are vaccinated, follow the current recommendations and public health measures, including getting tested when you have symptoms, as the minister um, emphasized. If you're unvaccinated, follow the measures and recommendations very closely, as this COVID does not allow much room for error. Now, do vaccinated people um, get sick when they, when they do get COVID? A few people do, mostly in those who are already more susceptible by age or by compromised immune systems. And even then, severe outcomes are rare, but they will occur once in a while, especially if large numbers of people continue to get infected and spread the virus around. What is clear is how this outbreak or wave is being driven by the gamma variant, tearing its way through unvaccinated people and the networks that they gather in. So what are some of the other aspects that we're seeing in this outbreak so far? We're seeing cases becoming, I would say, increasingly concentrated within the urban vulnerable populations. Three quarters of the cases are linked to other known cases, and that is good, but it also means that we're still seeing a significant number of cases not clearly linked to others. So people are getting exposed without knowing it. As I said, infection continues to predominate within the unvaccinated population. <clears throat> and as I said, of those admitted to either a Yukon or out of territory hospital, the majority are unvaccinated, the vast majority are unvaccinated. And those individuals who are vaccinated and require hospitalization have had underlying comorbidities or other chronic medical conditions and, and or have been of advanced age. The rural situation we have begun reporting by community according to request from First Nations and municipal leaders. And so that's a change in practice. So because COVID is widespread, we have changed our usual practice for communicating uh, com communicable disease, as it's more practical for communities to communicate publicly to their citizens and to help keep them updated on COVID risk in their communities. And we will do our best to keep on publishing these numbers, but recognize again that exact numbers can be hard to reconcile as people do not always identify their community of residence, people do move around, and tracking of all the rapid tests, the gene expert results at the hospital, the standard uh, tests that we send out to BC by community, in addition to tracking hospital admissions and recoveries is, is challenging and may lead to occasional inaccuracies. However, this should help to give communities an idea of their current COVID risk. Do recognize, recognize, though, that you should not change your personal behavior based on community case numbers. While we have COVID circulating in Yukon, assume that COVID is present in your community and act accordingly. That means, of course, following the safe six, sticking to six, those sticking to limiting your contacts, keeping gatherings very small, and get tested if you have any symptoms. We have responded to new cases in certain communities, especially uh, where we've been concerned about possible hidden spread of COVID. And that's in part by sending out rapid response testing teams. 
At the moment, as the minister said, we're deploying a team to Old Crow and another is in Mayo. And these teams are offering accessible rapid testing for uh, the public in those communities. A team is in Mayo at the J.V. Clark School today, and in Old Crow, the testing clinic will be open from today, 11.30 to 3.30, through Friday at the school in Old Crow. As we follow the virus activity throughout communities, we will continue to support health centers and communities with increased testing capacity where necessary uh, as part of our management of COVID-19 cases. I know there's a lot of anxiety in the communities right now, but in each community we have been working closely with leaders and health center staff, organizing an assessment of risk per community. And that's based on COVID activity, location of the community, the population, the vaccine uptake, and other factors. So at this moment, we're mobilizing every effort we can to ensure the communities have the resources and support they need at this moment. And we have people on the ground. We have supportive and very engaged leaders and the capacity to manage and contain the current cases within rural Yukon. Now, the activity in daycares appears to have leveled off in recent days, but we have seen exposures to COVID within a number of daycares and may continue to. And therefore, we have posted several daycare exposure notifications. We've also posted exposures for a local hotel and, of course, other areas prior to that as well. Now, about working while sick, I, I understand that symptoms sometimes can be so mild, you just you just want to kind of put them to the back of your mind or ignore them. And whether in daycares or in restaurants or mines or other settings where exposure to fellow workers or the public can occur, we have repeatedly seen people who have gone to work while sick. Please remember this has caught us out and caused cases or outbreaks repeatedly since last year. Please stay away from others and get tested when you have symptoms. And again, for those who cannot easily take a sick day, please remember that the sick leave rebate program is in place for this reason. Whether you're an employee or an employer, rebates that the minister listed are, are available and should be used. Going to work sick is something that can be avoided. So please avoid going to work even if your symptoms seem mild. Arrange for a test, self-isolate until you get your test result and the advice from YCDC on what to do next. Now, we have one of the highest vaccination rates in Canada, and right now we have the highest rate of COVID activity within the country, if not the continent. And though we may have surpassed now that 75% of the eligible um, adult population now fully vaccinated, unfortunately, it's not a time to celebrate, as our time with COVID-19 is far from over. So this situation has proven that we still have a heavily susceptible population at risk for COVID-19. If we consider our current population, which is fully vaccinated, minus the age group, which is under 11 and ineligible to receive immunization, we're left roughly with 10,000 individuals susceptible to COVID-19. For a population of our size, that is not just a number. That number is representative of people who are in our lives, maybe people we pass by or wave to on the street, maybe live with, people who would take part in a family gathering, whose cubicle we may be seated next to at work. We all know someone who is unvaccinated and is in turn susceptible to this aggressive virus. Now, as mentioned, this ongoing wave is heavily affecting a large portion of our vulnerable populations. And there are individuals who do not have the socioeconomic supports in place to lean on during a time such as this. And due to predominantly congregate living situations, living with, with others, transmission can occur rapidly throughout this population. So whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, 
you need to assume that you have the virus or that the people you come into contact with have the virus and act accordingly. We do have this social firebreak in place with the res restrictions on gathering that I'm asking you to abide with. And we need at least another week to evaluate if this firebreak has worked or is working as we hope it will to bend the current curve and bring us back closer to normal. So where do we go from here? Of course, our focus right now is on getting through this outbreak, preventing further illness, treating it well when we see it, relieving our tired healthcare and public health workforce with some extra relief and using this prolonged and difficult period to help us to learn to live the next years of living with this virus. In order to do so, we still need to ensure that as many people are vaccinated as possible. To the best of our efforts, we need to work together on decreasing the real threats from the virus, which are hospitalization, serious illness, and ultimately death, which we have seen much too often in these past weeks. Recognizing these outbreaks are having such an impact on Yukon's marginalized populations and seeing the, a need for vastly increased social and wellness supports. We're working very closely with social services to provide resources for individuals to lean on. And one thing I'd like Yukoners to think about is with this pandemic and particularly this, this wave, it really is taking a heavy toll on Yukon. And the more this virus is percolating in the territory, the more cases, of course, we'll, we'll see emerge alongside more hospitalizations and serious illness it will cause. And of course, it will also, as it is in the world, uh, as we see, as we watch, it will behave in ways that we can't necessarily predict. But it is putting many people's lives at risk. We're all affected by this, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated. So we need to keep together and band together and follow the guidance and really focus our efforts on protecting this community of ours. We have lost three people to the virus in one month, more than we have in the previous year. Many others are hospitalized. And there may be individuals who will be enduring long-term effects for weeks or months, perhaps years to come. So for today, tomorrow, Next week, please make sure you follow the safe six plus one, self-monitor your symptoms, get tested if you become ill, self-isolate when it's necessary, and most importantly, get vaccinated and stick to six for now. We know from tired experience that this virus won't stop unless we take the necessary steps and do everything in our power to get it back under control so that we can then carry on with our lives. That's it for today. Thank you. Be kind, stay patient, stay strong, stay together, and stay well. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. We'll now go to the phone lines and we'll begin with Luke from CKRW. Uh, no questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to Haley, Yukon News. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could provide some more specific information on what supports are being offered to more vulnerable people, people who, as you mentioned, um, might not have the resources to effectively isolate. Just what's being done for folks that um, might normally head to the shelter or, um, yeah, are having difficulty self-isolating. Yeah, thank you. That's a really um, uh, important question, and um, I'll, I'll list a few maybe examples of things that I, I can think of. Um, one is, uh, and maybe the most important, is, is having people, um, well, of course, think of it, you're, you're self-isolating, you're often in, in a hotel, um, such as the, the High Country Inn and Whitehorse, in a room and it's hot and you're used to being outside and gathering with your friends, then you may have, uh, you may have needs and those needs may be as simple as a, 
as a, as a soft drink or um, something to eat. But they may be more complex, such as uh, uh, needing, uh, tr needing drugs um, or uh, needing, uh, needing a cigarette or needing a drink. And, and so um, one, of the, uh, one of the key things as well is needing companionship and needing a familiar face. So the, that's kind of the spectrum of, of things that we're trying to bolster and support. And, and I think there are fairly dramatic examples of when, when situations have been escalating because of people just getting restless, terribly restless, and then maybe getting into an, encounters. Um, and uh, uh, and situations can escalate rapidly, and then having um, having support workers, uh, case workers, social workers, who can come in and just be uh, be familiar. Uh, people who know these these clients um, can and has made a um, made a significant difference. So really, just having people familiar, experienced uh, case management, social worker, counselor, uh, people uh, more on the ground and more sort of steadily on the ground at self-isolation facilities at West. So it's really kind of mo mobilizing people, moving people around, asking for surge supports, and, and really having those people around to help uh, keep people calm, keep them, uh, keep them providing the, the, the supports that they need is, is critical to that. And then part of it is, is um, some of those harm reduction measures, providing access maybe to tobacco, maybe to, uh, yeah, to, 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 to a drink, providing alcohol um, where, it's, where it's indicated. Or on the other hand, providing um, access to withdrawal management for, for people who don't uh, want to uh, drink anymore if they have been drinking um, in an addictive way and, uh, and need to go, kind of go through supervised withdrawal. Um, and, and so a lot of it is around addictions management, whether that's a support um, or harm reduction with supply, ongoing supply, or a withdrawal, supervised withdrawal management. And then um, it's phone calls. It's just access to people by, by, by phone and, and helping those, those communications. And of course, organizing the best place to stay for that individual, and that often the individual staying in at home, or if 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 they have a home, and ensuring that that's a safe place to stay. It might be in a tent. It might be um, in in someone else's house, um, and making sure that that can be organized safely. Or if not, if it cannot be supported or organized safely, finding the best facility, whether that's at the shelter, whether that's at one of the self isolation facilities. Or, um, or 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 another hotel or or somewhere like that. So it's really that whole spectrum of supports um, as much round the clock as can be managed. Thank you. Next question, Haley. Yeah, my other question, kind of on a different track. Um, there was mentions there that uh, healthcare support. Um, people have come in from different districts in Ontario. I was wondering if you could be a little more specific about um, where these helpers are coming from. Again, uh, I'm going to say that an earlier version of my notes had, us, had listed um, all those locations. Um, I can certainly get back to you on that, uh, Haley. Uh, I know that some have come from Durham region. I don't want to guess at the others. Uh, I know, uh, I think, Niagara Falls area as well. But uh, why don't we get back to you on the specific uh, uh, health uh, districts in Ontario that have supported us? Uh, that work has been done by um, contact by Health and Social Services, uh, the Yukon government contacting uh, uh, counterparts across the country, and in particular uh, in Ontario, because they uh, they tend to have uh, more people available, and certainly we're responsive to uh, to sending folks over. Uh, our, we're continuing to work with our counterparts for uh, other provinces and territories across the country, uh, and including uh, working closely with British Columbia to see what supports uh, they can manage. Um, you can you are aware. I know that um, the federal government has responded with respect to our flood relief requests uh, with um, some uh, Canadian Forces staff, uh, and uh, all of that is much appreciated. But our, uh, our work continues to make sure that we have uh, additional people to help us manage this process, and I can get you those uh, Ontario locations, and we'll get back to you. 
Thank you. We'll move now to Hannah, Canadian Press. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell me um, uh, whether there are uh, any uh, additional cases that might not have been uh, uh, that you might not have been able to get through testing. Uh, are there uh, more cases than you actually have? Is, is uh, do you think that they might uh, uh, testing hasn't gotten everywhere because some people have mild illnesses and they may not actually. Uh, uh, get get themselves tested. So do you think there are more cases than there actually are reported? Thank you. That is a great question. And, uh, y you know, I, I think one of my biggest concerns is exactly that, that people are um, are have symptoms and are not getting tested. And when you start to see sick people, and as as um, as you may recall at the beginning, we did have a few people sick, um, hospitalized cases, really right early at the beginning. And what that tells you is that there has been transmission, there had been transmission going on undetected, leading to uh, enough people getting sick. Uh, enough people getting infected that some people start to get sick because, as you know, for the most part, this is a mild illness, and and you generally need lots of people infected to get to get sick. So uh, there's also another number that we're looking at closely with concern, and that's that's called our um, positivity ratio, and right now that's at 15 uh, percent. So 15 percent of the tests that are being done are turning out to be positive cases. Now that's that's a high number, and it suggests that uh, we, um, we are not getting to the bottom yet of, uh, of, of this. We're not, we're not really showing that we're um, beyond the peak yet until we can really see that number going down. In other words, we want to test lots of people so that uh, we're finding lots of negative results as, uh, and, and we should be you know, gradually going down to a sort of a 2%, 1% test positivity ratio. So um, I think there's lots of undetected disease out there. Uh, obviously, we don't know how many, uh, but sometimes in situations like this, it may be two or three times what the actual confirmed cases are. So that's why... I would rather find lots of cases today and tomorrow and next week, lots and lots of cases, and, and find them and detect them and contain them uh, so that we will prevent more people getting, getting sick. Um, so I actually hope we find lots of cases in the next little while so we can really show that we're getting ahead of this. Thank you. Do you have another question? Uh, I was wondering also, uh, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Hanley. I was also wondering uh, if you have seen any cases of the Delta variant. I know uh, most of the transmission here is gamma, but uh, have you seen any cases of the Delta? And how worried are you about the spread of Delta? Because that seems to be uh, uh, not, uh, not responding very well to vaccinations, and it's uh, highly transmissible. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I would say that, when, well, firstly, we have not. We have not detected Delta. It, it of course, is a concern. Um, I, I think that um, uh, Delta may add um, additional challenges um, to Gamma, but, but I also think they're not that far apart. I mean, uh, really, any COVID, uh, any COVID, particularly a variant, can spread easily amongst unvaccinated people. Um, but the 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 delta the delta seems to throw even more challenges in terms of how easily transmissible it is, and therefore there is potential for for spread. We have not detected it as yet. We are of course um, uh, uh, getting uh, regular updates and uh, uh, updates through. Uh, uh, th through screening for variants, and we have not uh, as yet detected Delta. I will say the vaccine data so far is reassuring for Delta. Um, of course, there's more and more real world experience going on, but two doses, I mean, really that you have to look at the effectiveness of two doses. So two doses of vaccine do, do appear to be substantially protective against the Delta variant. So again, uh, highly, uh, where if we can get higher and higher in our population uptake and get to fully vaccinated high, high population uptake, that will definitely be protective against uh, Delta variant. Thank you. We'll move now to Tim, Whitehorse Star. 
Yes, good morning. Thank you. Uh, first question is probably for Dr. Hanley. Um, the minister can jump in as well. Uh, it's regarding the uh, you're encouraging people to go out and get tested whenever they have symptoms. Is that possibly a little simplistic because you have lots of people with asthma and other lung conditions that are diagnosed that will mimic the symptoms, and even people with seasonal allergies uh, could flood departments getting a test when it's, they probably know it's just allergies? Or is it better to go with the better safe than sorry approach? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thanks, Tim. And really, I, w I would just go back to basics here. It's a really good question, um, by the way, and, and it is something that I think every everyone with sh symptoms should think about and then do the COVID screening. Uh, I, in other words, go through the online um, the online assessment and and then see because there there are um, there are cases where. Um, if someone has um, perennial known symptoms and is coming on in a completely predictable way, well, I'm not too worried about that. But think about also what might have might have triggered something. So sometimes uh, this can be this can be subtle. I'm not too worried about flooding uh, testing centers right now. Um, we have we've got lots of capacity for testing, and we can always increase capacity if we need to. Um, so, so look online, do the assessment, see see if your symptoms fit with the recommendations for testing. We've done a lot of work on, on, on trying to sift through. You know, when when is the right time to get a test? Right now, the test the threshold for testing should be very low because we 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 really want to find people with symptoms, and identify them and get uh, get on top of this transmission. Do you have another question, Tim? Yes, uh, I know this has been asked before, it's so probably going to be asked again, but um, you're talking about another week or two to evaluate how things are going. Do you have any kind of set threshold on when maybe lower the boom with more restrictions uh, if this doesn't respond the, the way you hope? Yeah, I mean, we we uh, we we have, a, I guess, a series of layers, but we have to we have to treat what we see, right? And 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 I think part of it is where where are we seeing transmission, and then how, how do we respond to that? And so, um, if we're seeing transmission largely uh, through this uh, through this current um, urban network as our biggest contributor, and trying to identify strands of transmission, it's really important at this time to limit limit gathering so that if there is unidentified disease out there, it's not going to be spread by gathering sizes. So it's, uh, I, I think we have the right uh, level of measures in place as long as people are following what we ask them to do. If you were asking about, say, lockdown measures, would we be shutting down workplaces? Would be would we be, you know, curtailing on retail? I mean, those are those are things that don't would would not really make a difference in this in the spread or the transmission of based on what we're seeing now. I mean, again, the the, the reality of public health measures. In uh, in a population with this higher level of vaccine is very different from what we might have had to do and would have done very promptly a year ago. So it's really continually trying to assess where are we seeing risk, where are we seeing transmission, and are we are are we getting a lid on it? And and there's always a time lag between the the time when you ask um, ask for something to be done, which is now a week ago, and and seeing what the what the effect is. But this is why it's so important for people to um, to assume there's lots of disease out there. As as I said, there 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 is uh, much activity out there and and much undetected activity out there right now. So we need to, for that reason, limit limit gatherings, limit contacts between people, and find through testing any uh, any transmission threads of undetected disease. Thank you. On va maintenant passer à Marine Laura Boréal. Merci. Um, C'est une question pour le docteur Henley. Uh, juste pour être, uh, pour, pour bien comprendre et pour être clair, est-ce que les règles de rassemblement et toutes les règles sanitaires que, que vous avez mises en place s'appliquent même pour les personnes qui sont vaccinées? 
So just to be absolutely clear, do all the measures that you have in place right now apply to everybody, even those that have been vaccinated? Oui. Uh, oui, c'est très important pour, pour tout le monde de, de participer. Maintenant, um, pour plusieurs raisons, une, c'est que pour les rassemblements, ça sera um, de, surtout dans les, dans les endroits publics, ce sera impossible de distinguer entre ceux qui sont vaccinés et ceux qui sont non vaccinés. Et euh, euh, donc, c'est pour tout le monde de participer. Aussi, euh, comme on a, euh, on voit des cas, même chez les vaccinés, euh, pour le moment, c'est avec, avec tant de transmissions qu'on a. On a, comme j'ai expliqué euh, euh, tantôt, on a, on a même des personnes vaccinées qui sont, euh, qui sont touchées euh, par, par ce virus. Donc, c'est pour protéger tout le monde et pour avoir une approche consistante euh, pour toute la population qu'on demande ça à, à tout le monde euh, pour le, présentement, pour, le, euh, pour, les, pour, les, euh, pour les semaines qu'on passe euh, à ce moment. Et après, euh, après une autre semaine, on peut faire une, une réanalyse pour voir est-ce qu'il faut euh, continuer euh, avec ça ou euh, qu'est-ce qu qu que sont les, les prochaines mesures d'appliquer selon euh, les risques et la, les, la, la transmission, transmission qu'on voit. Merci. Avez-vous une autre question, Marine? Oui, euh, euh, c'est une question qui est reliée à ma première question. Est-ce que des personnes vaccinées peuvent potentiellement être... Euh, Uh, non symptomatique et transmettre le, le virus. So, are, is it possible for people who have been vaccinated to not have symptom and pass on the virus to other people around them? Ça, c'est une question plutôt pour les... Euh, euh, pour, pour, pour voir avec la, la recherche qui a globalement qui continue Uh, c'est uh, une question très difficile à répondre, mais on peut, uh, on peut voir selon les études jusqu'au maintenant, c'est uh, probablement très rare qu'on peut avoir uh, une personne uh, avec infection asymptomatique et transmettre l'infection aux autres. Mais ce n'est pas, pas toujours défini. Donc, c'est une question qui, qui est toujours... Uh, Uh, on, sous étude uh, pour, um, pour, pour faire avec, avec plus d'analyse. C'est sûr que uh, la, la taux d'infection de, de, est beaucoup plus diminuée uh, chez les vaccinés et la taux de transmission est, est, est coupée, au moins coupée en deux. Mais uh, on, a, on a plus d'analyse à faire pour être uh, définitif sur ces questions. I will ask you to repeat that one in English, please. The question was whether um, whether it's possible for vaccinated people to be um, to have an asymptomatic um, infection and and then to pass it on to others. And of course, that's that's been a, a question that uh, globally uh, with uh, with studies, um, everyone's been trying to find out. And and we have had many reassuring studies so far on that, which show that. Asymptomatic infection appears to be vastly reduced, and the chance of transmission uh, is probably cut in half, even if you are infected. Uh, but it's still an ongoing question that we that it would that before we have definitive answers to that, we do know that there's a dramatic effect from uh, from the vaccine, particularly those who are fully vaccinated, on um, asymptomatic infection and transmission to others. Thank you. Et maintenant, Claudiane, Radio-Canada. Oui, um, first, I'd just like to say I'm also interested uh, to the details of the nurses being deployed from uh, outside the territory, where they are, how many, uh, what their um, tasks will be. So I, I would like to be provided with that uh, information as well, with still pictures, if possible, of that. So that's my request. And maintenant, pour la question, en français, Dr. Henley. Um, donc, un peu de me répéter en français uh, votre, uh, vos, uh, 
aux impressions en ce moment par rapport au nombre possible d'infections qui ne sont pas encore répertoriées ou recensées. Est-ce qu'il vaudrait peut-être la peine d'ouvrir le, les tests de dépistage à ceux qui sont asymptomatiques pour essayer de dépister? Parce que vous dites que vous voulez, vous voulez trouver ces, ces, ces cas-là là, qui, sont, qui ne sont pas diagnostiqués. Alors, me, me donnez un peu votre impression à ce moment que vous souhaitez voir au cours du prochain jour avec les tests de dépistage. So, Dr. Henley, could you please repeat in French uh, your worries about uh, the number of cases that have not been detected at this point that might still uh, be out there and, and infecting other people? And uh, would it be a, a, a possibility at this point to open testing to people who do not have symptoms so that you would have a better uh, picture of how many of these cases might be out there? Oui, merci. Um, C'est... Uh ce, ce que j'ai expliqué en, en anglais, c'était que avec la, la, le taux de positivité, donc on a um, à peu près 15 de cas uh, de, de cas positivité. Donc ça veut dire que um, avec, um, avec tout les, tout, tout le dépistage qu'on fait, um, on, on a un, un taux de positivité de 15 Ça suggère, ce nombre suggère qu'il y a beaucoup de, de cas qui sont non détectés. Et ça peut, ça peut arriver à deux, trois fois le, le cas actuel qu'on a confirmé um, avec des, des tests positifs. Donc, normalement, uh, le cible pendant une vague comme ça, c'est d'aller à 3, 2 uh, éventuellement 1, 1 de positivité. Et comme ça, on sait qu'on on, on, on a, on a, uh, on a testé beaucoup de gens pour, pour être assuré qu'on a, euh, a trouvé la majorité des cas. Donc, euh, à 15%, ça, ça, ça nous dit qu'il y, y a plus de progrès, progrès à faire de, de vraiment trouver des cas. Pour la question de dépistage asymptomatique euh, public, on a, on a vu que ça, en fait, c'est n'est pas une stratégie qui, qui marche bien. On, on, parce que là, on va, avec, avec la, une, une, une grande ouverture à dépistage euh, chez les asymptomatiques, surtout chez une population euh, vaccinée, on va commencer à trouver des, des faux positifs. Et, et avec ça aussi, on a, on, on a le risque de, de, de vraiment euh, exciter, les de, exciter les demandes ou de la capacité des centres de, de, de dépistage. Et ce qu'on a vu dans d'autres endroits au Canada où on a essayé de faire ça. Mais il faut, ce qu'on fait, en fait, au contraire, c'est de, euh, si on peut cibler le dépistage chez les personnes symptomatiques, on a beaucoup plus de chances de trouver des vrais positifs. Et des, 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 c est, c est, c est, on va où on a l'argent, le, 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 ça veut dire. Que donc, euh, donc, vraiment, si on cible le, 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 le dépistage, on a le, le, le meilleure chance. Avant dit ça, c'est aussi dans les on a de, des situations où, en fait où, où on a où on a plus de risques des cas de transmission où on fait exactement ça. Donc on, on essaie d'encercler les zones de haut risque pour trouver des, euh, des, 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 des filles de transmission euh, non détectées. Par exemple, on a fait ça dans, des, dans certaines communautés avec le dépistage rapide. Euh, on a invité tout le monde euh, qui veut de, de venir pour un test pour, parce que c'est vraiment d'encercler un, un endroit 
assez isolé et à haut risque où on peut avoir peut-être plus de transmission répandue que dans une situation générale urbaine publique. Et aussi, euh, on a dans certains foyers, dans certaines euh, euh, situations euh, euh, des, des, des édifices publics où on a beaucoup de personnes infectées, on peut, on peut inviter tout le monde ou essayer de, de, de tester tout le monde, en fait, même, même ceux qui sont asymptomatiques, parce que là, on a beaucoup, beaucoup plus de chances pour trouver des cas euh, autrement non détectés. Donc, c'est vraiment une un approche stratégique euh, pour, euh, pour, selon la, la risque de transmission non détectée. Thank you. Avez-vous une autre question, Claudiane? Oui, je, je suis désolée, mais de, de me, de me, merci beaucoup, mais de me répéter euh, en français, euh, cette fois-ci, par rapport aux défis euh, qui, euh, que, que comprennent l'isolement ou la gestion de la pandémie au sein de la population vulnérable. Quels sont ces, ces défis présentement? So, could you please repeat in French uh, uh, the uh, the challenges that the vulnerable population present uh, for testing and uh, treating them at this point? We. Oui, um Merci. C'est euh, c'est euh, une population euh, vulnérable pour 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 plusieurs raisons et ils sont euh, ils sont plus vulnérables euh, aux euh, aux maladies plus sévères parce que souvent ils ont des maladies chroniques euh, ou des des situations euh, qui qui le fait plus euh, à, à plus haut risque pour pour maladies plus sévères. Et euh, aussi, ils ont, euh, ils ont souvent euh, euh, plus, de, euh, plus de, de, de besoins pour, pour appui, appui social. Donc, il faut, euh, c'est très important pour eux, pour, <coughs> imagine, parce qu'ils sont des, des, euh, des gens assez, assez euh, euh, connectés, un à l'autre, socialement très connectés. Et, euh, et qui, si, qui, qui sont euh, souvent mobiles et qui, qui ont une tendance normale à rassembler. Donc, pour, pour une personne comme ça, souvent avec des, euh, des conditions euh, de santé mentale euh, ou des, des besoins mentaux, euh, c'est très difficile pour eux de s'auto-isoler, surtout pendant deux semaines. Donc, c'est c'est un temps pour, 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 pour les comprendre, pour, les, pour comprendre les besoins et pour, pour renforcer les appuis sociaux qu'ils ont besoin avec des, des personnes. Euh, euh, Peut-être euh, priorité, c'est pour avoir des personnes familières, expérimentées, euh, qui les personnes connaissent. Et, 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 euh, mais aussi, c'est aussi pour avoir... Um, pour les appuyer avec uh, l'assistance pour ceux qui sont en des, de, des addictions. Si c'est des appuis pour, um, pour l'abstention d'alcool ou, ou à, au contraire pour fournir l'alcool uh, dans des situations plus stables pour, um, um, ou, ou des tabacs ou des drogues um, pour, um, pour reconnaître les besoins et pour les, les rencontrer où on est, pour les appuyer, pour continuer la, la, la période d'isolation. Donc, euh, beaucoup de défis, c'est sûr, mais aussi, euh, il faut dire que malgré les, les défis, euh, pour la plupart des gens, ils sont très coopératifs, ils, ils veulent faire ce qu'il faut pour euh, limiter la transmission dans leur communauté. Et euh, donc, il y a, on, on a beaucoup gagné aussi pour encercler la transmission, mais c'est un travail qui doit continuer. Thank you. And now we'll go to Jackie, CBC. Hello. Um, I'm wondering about whether self-isolation check-ins have changed at all. I recall when I was self-isolating kind of earlier on, um, I basically just got a text message over the past, over the 14 days. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any new measures now that we're in this wave. 
Yeah. Um, the uh, of course this is for um, for domestic uh, self isolation for check ins. Yes. So there has been um, a, we're, we're, we've been trying to as part of and this was originally even before the wave as part of the path forward, the um, strengthening the foundation was looking at how, how can we uh, how can we reinforce. Um, existing measures around uh, quarantine, and one of those was trying to reinforce the, the calls and the text messages that come. So increasing the frequency was one of our aims, and we have, uh, I think there have been glitches with IT, but I believe now that the the, the regular texting, I believe it's daily, has been, um, has uh, been uh, Restarted or continued, or um, amplified for um, check-ins for people in uh, self-isolation. Um, now that's whether they're in quarantine for travel reasons or um, for um, those who are as part of this uh, wave have to be in uh, isolation as contacts. And we've we've really been strengthening and working on daily calls, especially. And and then it, it really goes to those who who have higher needs, as I've been talking about with with some of those who are experiencing more difficulty uh, to, to ensure that those are supportive calls, not just sort of check-ins. Uh, some people might just need a, a check-in every day or two. Others might need much more um, uh, solid supports. So cases are always, always get daily calls and uh, contacts depending on their risk status get either daily or every other day and sometimes amplified and, and maybe sometimes even multiple calls. So definitely that's a really important part is the, um, of the response is those check-ins kind of according to risk of the uh, contact and weather uh, and, and making sure that they are there for, for cases. Do you have a follow-up, Jackie? <laughs> I do. Um, this might kind of speak to you uh, the answers you gave around discrepancy for numbers, but I noticed for the community portal, um, some communities are listed as just having five or under five cases. I'm wondering why that is. And also, um, at least as of yesterday, um, at the top of the webpage, it said there were 149 active cases, but then in the community breakdown, it said Whitehorse had 200 confirmed cases. Um, is that also just related to confirming people who have recovered and home communities and all that? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of the complexities without perhaps being able to give you the exact answer to that question around numbers. But uh, one one complexity is uh, what we are going. We have had the request to publish less than five, and and so we're looking at that right now for uh, potential revisions. Um, it is a standard way that we report um, communicable diseases. You'll see in our health status reports, for example, that usually we don't uh, report less than five as a, as a way of protecting identities of, of individuals. But we also heard from the, uh, from the communities that they wish to see, um, uh, given the magnitude of the current cases, they wish to see the, the smaller numbers. So we're working on an approach for that. Um, the... It, it, it's, it's actually very difficult to give precise daily information for all of the reasons I said, but also because there's a difference between um, testing location and residence. So, so uh, uh, someone might be, um, for example, from one of the communities and tested in, in Whitehorse. Um, and so then uh, what we're trying to do it by where you were tested and whether you were actually in, present in the community. And sometimes that takes a while to ascertain that level of information. And so there's going to be that lag between sometimes uh, knowing where someone is um, and where they were tested and where they are now. And that might reflect you know, some differences in counting from day to day and moving people around from one place to another. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. The regular COVID-19 update will take place on Wednesday, July 14th at 10.30 a.m.